Good morning, and welcome to the 20th annual meeting of the National Forum for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention. The organization co-founded by the CDC, American Heart Association, Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, and National Association of Chronic Disease Directors. Its purpose then was to lead public-private nonprofit collaboration to implement the National Public Health Action Plan to prevent heart disease and stroke, to enable the nation to reap the benefit from the sharing of knowledge and experience in cardiovascular health improvement. I hope you enjoyed the networking session. I am excited about the panels and town hall that we are about to begin. First, I need to point out a few things about the virtual meeting. While we may be physically separated, we can still be part of the conversation throughout the day. Please use the chat function to comment on the meeting topic and panel discussions, share information, and catch up with friends and colleagues. Helpful tips and links will also be placed in chat. To ask questions, please use the Q&A feature. The panels may not get to every question today, but we will gather all the questions and see if we can include responses with the meeting summary. We are using closed captioning. You can control how it appears on your screen by using the CC button on Zoom. Today's meeting is being recorded. If you have colleagues who cannot be with us right now, they can catch the whole meeting on demand in a couple of weeks. When the recording and meeting summary are posted, the National Forum will send you the link. Please share it with others who may be interested. Biographical sketches for all of today's speakers are in the virtual program book. They are impressive, and I commend them to you. This convening and your no-charge participation are made possible by our generous sponsors. Thank you to Amgen, AstraZeneca, and Novartis. Following our panel discussions, National Forum members and other participants will give quick updates on how they are building and broadening support for health equity. Many members who want to give updates signed up in advance. If you would like to give a brief update, up to two minutes, on your organization's work to build public support for health equity, let the conference team know in Q&A. As you listen to the panels and member updates today, think about the actions that your organization can take to expand support throughout the US for health equity. Time permitting, we will have questions and answers with members of the panels. As I said at the outset, this is the 20th National Forum Annual Meeting. To celebrate this milestone, the National Forum invited our founding chair emeritus, Darwin Labarth, and those who succeeded him to share their reflections on the organization's progress over the last two decades. Their comments will be interspersed throughout the meeting. Toward the end of the meeting, National Forum voting members will elect members of the board of directors and take part in a brief business meeting. And the National Forum will present awards for exceptional leadership and accomplishments to carry out the National Public Health Action Plan to prevent heart disease and stroke, advance policies to improve population health, and innovate to improve cardiovascular health in communities. As we meet today, more than two and a half times as many Americans have died from COVID as were killed in World War II. One year ago, I commented that if there were any upsides to the pandemic, they might be that first, more people were aware of health inequities, and second, people had a greater appreciation for public health. When we gathered a year ago, I think we shared feelings of hope and optimism. We hoped that heightened awareness of health disparities and inequities and outrage over the murder of George Floyd meant health equity's time had come. We talked here about not shifting back to the old normal after the pandemic, but rather advancing to a new normal in which the U.S. invests where it matters to eliminate health disparities, to slash intolerably high maternal and child mortality rates, to exceed 80% hypertension control across the population, and to equitably improve cardiovascular health. In short, we envisioned a healthier future for all. But 
in the last year, we have seen concerns about inflation, crime, reproductive health, and other issues overtake health equity as a public priority. We have seen large numbers of Americans ignore public health advice and rebel against perceived government infringement of personal freedoms in the name of protecting public health. As you and I took the illumination of racial and ethnic disparities as a call to action, we may not have fully grasped the very different ways that millions of our fellow Americans were processing and reacting to the same information. In the last year, we've learned from University of Georgia researchers that white people who thought or were told that COVID disproportionately harmed people of color had less fear of the virus, had less empathy toward vulnerable populations, and were less supportive of measures to prevent the spread of COVID. In the last year, we learned that after COVID vaccines became available, most high-income countries recovered their losses in life expectancy from early in the pandemic. But life expectancy in the U.S. continued to decline. The public resistance to public health guidance on preventing the spread of COVID and the lack of priority on health equity share some roots. Without delving into deconstructing the worldviews, ideologies, and motivations that cause so many Americans to be unconcerned about health equity, let me jump to the end of the story. If we who advocate for, and in many cases, dedicate our professional lives to advancing health equity, are to build the broad public support necessary to win legislative approval for policies and resources that will help people throughout society to attain cardiovascular health, we must step outside our comfort zones and see beyond our own frames of reference. When we talk about improving the well-being of people who are marginalized, we routinely say we need to meet people where they are. That is exactly what we must do to expand support for health equity. Except that this time, the people we must meet where they are, are those who do not think health equity affects them or people who look like them or people who live where they do. Our friend Mark Fendrick at the University of Michigan VBID Center observes that people don't care how much health care costs. They care how much it costs them. Mark's observation applies to health equity, too. People don't care how much health inequity costs the health care system, but they may care how much it costs them. Meeting people where they are in large swaths of America is the focus of today's National Forum meeting. We will learn about the economic cost of health inequity not just at the macro level, but at the kitchen table. We will learn how to relate policies that improve health equity to the priorities of people in middle America. We will hear from people who have researched how to do that and leaders who've succeeded in gaining support in their communities for interventions that improve health equity. Now, lest I sound like Debbie Downer, I am pleased to celebrate some big policy wins in the last two years. Policies proven to improve people's access to evidence-based care that is appropriate for them. The consensus goal of the patient, provider, public health, payer, purchaser, and pharma organizations in the National Forum's Value and Access Collaborative. We have shared know-how that National Forum members are using to increase self-measured blood pressure control. And over a hundred mayors are using the National Forum's Move with the Mayor initiative to advance community guide programs and policies that improve cardiometabolic health. So we are building momentum and we can expand support for health equity if we meet other people where they are. 